Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 7 in Gen 115E Physical Science. Today we will be finishing off the section on work and energy in the second of two lectures on that specific topic. As always, my name is Kai Foster and I will be lecturing you for today's lesson as well as the rest. So let's get right into it and learn some more about work and energy. So coming up in today's lecture, we will start off by having a look at spring energy, another type of potential energy as you're about to find out, before looking at the conservation of mechanical energy, which is also basically an extension of the universal law of conservation of energy, but just made more applicable to our real world. We're then going to have a look at power or the rates at which work is done or energy is expended before having a look at work, energy and power in humans. So, of course, humans and animals are, are somewhat different as we know by now, but, you know, having a look at how this functions in humans, how these quantities sort of work within us can give us a better understanding as to how they work in other animals as well. So, getting right into it, let's have a look at spring potential energy. So another form of potential energy is the energy that can be found in a spring. So basically when we compress a spring, meaning we basically push the ends together or we elongate a spring, so the opposite of compression, basically pulling it apart, the spring will basically have the potential to exert a force as the spring will aim to return to its equilibrium position. So the equilibrium position will refer to the undeflected position or the position at which there are no forces acting on the spring. So the potential energy possessed by a spring depends on something called the spring constant. So when we talk about a spring constant, we're basically talking about how stiff a spring is. And basically the spring constant is related to how much deflection is undergone. So the amount of deflection will obviously impact the potential energy as well. So the amount of deflection will refer to by how much the spring has been elongated or compressed. And when we multiply this through by the spring constant, which we'll learn a little bit more about in the next few slides, then we can obtain a force. And obviously if we've got a force acting on a spring and since the potential energy can be stored, obviously it is possible for a spring to perform work on an object. So obviously, if we have a force applied over a distance, we know by now that force times distance times cos theta, if we have different angles, will be equal to the work done. So the amount of potential energy stored by a spring is equivalent to the amount of work that it is capable of doing. So this is important to remember, and it's also a piece of information that we can use a little bit later on when we start dealing with the conservation of mechanical energy. So having a look at the equation for the potential energy of a spring. So it can be given by PE, which stands for potential energy, subscript S standing for spring. So obviously with the gravitational potential force, we had PE subscript G. Here we have PE subscript S is equal to one over two times K, which is the spring constant times X squared. So as I said, K is the spring constant and how this works is basically if we compress or elongate a spring by x meters, then the force that the spring will exert will be equal to kx newtons. So the force that a spring exerts can be represented by f is equal to kx, it's that simple, and x is going to be the displacement of the spring. So having a look at the bottom over here, we see the diagram on the left hand side, and that's basically a spring at its equilibrium position, so nothing has been happened yet. Then on the right, we see, okay, the spring has been elongated by a distance x. So where I'm drawing this dotted red line now, that's where the equilibrium position was. So if we were to draw that spring in there, it would be something like that. And ending over there. And now basically it's been stretched and pulled out to extend. And obviously the spring wants to return to equilibrium. So it's exerting a force in the opposite direction to try pull it back. We'll have Newton's third law here, so if, say, my hand was pulling on this, then the force on my hand would be pulling at a force of kx newtons to the left, whereas the spring would be experiencing a force of kx newtons to the right. We then see as well what the work potential is of a spring, as well as the potential energy 
of a spring. And again, these are going to be equal, as we said in the previous slide, where basically the potential work that can be done by a spring will be equal to the potential energy that that spring possesses. So that is all on potential spring energy. We're going to obviously consolidate that with a worked example or two a little bit later on and try and incorporate that into the next section that we are going into as well, the conservation of mechanical energy. So we'll start off by looking at the equation for mechanical energy right off the bat. So mechanical energy or the conservation of mechanical energy rather can be given by this equation over here. So the kinetic energy in its initial phase, so subscript I represents initial, plus the initial potential energy. So again, remember, we've got two sources of potential energy, which is gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy, is going to be equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. So another way of saying this is basically that the sum of kinetic energy and potential energy will remain constant. So if we had a process going on where there's some energy transfer, then we know that within that system or the surroundings in the system, the kinetic energy and the potential energy, uh, the sum of those two are going to be equal in the first stage, in the second stage, in the third stage, in the final stage, every single phase the kinetic energy and the potential energy will remain constant. And that's basically indicating that the mechanical energy will be conserved. So I haven't mentioned it yet on this slide, but mechanical energy is simply equal to the sum of potential energy and kinetic energy. So another way of stating this equation in the first line is that the mechanical energy in its initial phase will be equal to its mechanical energy in the final stage. At the bottom there, we can just have a look at the nomenclature. So what, what means what over here? And it's pretty straightforward, it's nothing new here. Ke represents kinetic energy, Pe represents potential energy, and the subscript I will be initial, whereas subscript T, or F rather, is going to be final. Okay guys, so please do not get intimidated by any of these equations on the slide. I know they do look a little bit overwhelming, but it's really nothing new, nothing that you guys can't handle. So basically this is the extended form of the law of conservation of mechanical energy. So we look here from left to right, we've got all of the initial stages. So we say that the sum of the kinetic energy in its initial stage plus the initial gravitational potential energy plus the initial spring potential energy is equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final gravitational potential energy plus the final spring potential energy. So all we've done here is we've basically expanded the potential energies into their respective categories, gravitational and spring, as we spoke about on the previous slide. If we are to write this in its equation form with all of the variables over here, we see that a half times mv initial squared plus the mgh initial plus 1 over 2 kx initial squared, or the initial displacement, is equal to a half times mass times the final velocity squared, plus the mass times the gravitational, potential, uh, gravitational constant times the final height, plus a half times the spring constant times the spring displacement in its final stage squared. At the bottom over here, you can see the nomenclature again as well. So m is the mass of the object or the system, V is the object's velocity, G is the gravitational constant, which as we know is 9.8 meters per second squared, K will be the spring constant, H is the relative height of the object, and then as always, subscript I will be the referring to the initial values, and subscript F will be referring to the final values. So essentially, if you get a problem which has the elements of a spring, it's got velocity and it's got a change in height, then you're going to be using all three of these of these terms on either side of the equal sign, basically each quantity in its initial stage and each quantity in its final stage. So just a little bit of theory about the conservation of mechanical energy. So as I said a few slides ago, the total mechanical energy of a system or in an object will be equal to the system's potential energy plus the system's kinetic energy. So the law of conservation of mechanical energy states that the amounts of mechanical energy in a system 
will remain constant between its initial and final conditions. This is also supported by the alternative equation we had for the conservation of mechanical energy, where we said that the kinetic energy of a system plus the potential energy of a system will always remain constant. So basically what that is telling us is that regardless of what state a system or an object is in, at whatever stage in its, its process that it's going through, there will always, always, always be the same amount of mechanical energy in that system. And then we see here, okay, this formula only holds true for conservative forces. And in many of these cases, for example, friction, we will assume it to be negligible because of course friction is a non-conservative force as well a few other things we looked at in the previous lecture. And it's important to remember that, okay, if we deal with friction in a problem like this, then we know that we can't use the conservation of mechanical energy. If you see you can assume friction to be negligible in the question, then you know, okay, cool. Well, if this problem basically matches what we know and what we are looking for, for example, the kinetic energy, potential energies in terms of the gravitational and the spring potential energies, then we know, great, we can use the conservation of mechanical energy. There are also going to be many times where you need to make assumptions. For example, you can assume that the relative heights in a final or initial, initial stage is going to be equal to zero. If you are told that the object starts at rest or if it comes to rest, then we will know that, okay, one of these velocities will be equal to zero. And then you'll mostly be given the spring constant of a spring. Okay, so here we are at another worked example. I think the first for this lecture, if I'm not mistaken. So we see over here, okay, a 0 0.1 kilogram toy car is propelled by a compressed spring. The car follows a track that raises 0 0.18 meters above the starting point, and the spring is compressed by four centimeters and has a force constant or a spring constant of 250 newtons per meter. Assuming the work done by friction is negligible, find first how fast the car is going before it starts up the slope, and B, how fast it, is it going at the top of the slope. So just having a look at this question, can we use the conservation of mechanical energy? And the answer is yes, absolutely, because we see that the assumption over here is that the work done by friction is assumed to be negligible. And also breaking up this question into different parts, we asked a few different things. So how fast is the car going before it starts up the slope? So obviously if it's before going up the slope, we know that there's not going to be any change in potential gravitational energy. So we can assume that the height in both cases will be zero. And obviously, as we've spoken about with potential gravitational energy, the, the relative height is what's important here. So obviously, if we were to be at that starting point, we can let that point be zero. And the final height will be 18 centimeters relative to that initial starting position. But anyway, let's get into how we can actually solve this problem and get a solution to these questions. So first things first, let's write down the conservation of mechanical energy. So we write that in its equation form. We know that the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy is equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy, just like that. There we go. Okay, so then writing down what we know in this equation or in this problem already, we know that the toy car has a mass of 0 0.1 kilograms. So again, guys, it's always a really good idea to write down your knowns and your unknowns before you begin the problem. You know that the spring constant is 250 newtons per meter. There we go. We know that the final height the final relative height will be 0 0.18 meters. So again, we're converting centimeters into meters, which is the SI unit. And we always want to work with SI units. We know that the frictional force is going to be zero. So we don't have to worry about any work losses due to that. And we know that the initial displacement of the spring is going to be 0 0.04 meters or four centimeters, but again, we're going to be working with SI units. So looking at the first part of the problem, what do we know is going to be zero? So writing out the 
equation again in slightly extended form plus the potential gravitational energy Ooh, and this will be oh my bad that's supposed to be initial over there initial initial uh, initial spring potential energy and that's going to be equal to all of those energies in their final states Okay, now we can look at these. We can decide whether or not any of these are going to be zero. So first of all, initial kinetic energy. So we know that the spring is pulled back to four centimeters. And at that point, the initial velocity is going to be zero. So we know, okay, great. Initial kinetic energy is going to be equal to zero. Then the initial gravitational energy. So that's at the starting point. There's no relative height, so we can assume that will be zero as well initial spring potential energy so that we are told that the spring has been pulled back by four centimeters so we know okay great the spring will be giving us some potential energy to begin with and that will basically allow this toy car to gain in the second part of the problem the potential gravitational energy and obviously kinetic energy so we know okay cool this is what we're looking for in this problem i'll quickly underline that in purple we are looking for the final velocity before it goes up the slope so again before it goes up the slope the relative height will still be at zero and we know okay cool the spring is no longer compressed or elongated it's not touching the toy car anymore so it will have no effect on that toy car and that will also be zero so now we've simplified our pretty intimidating pretty long conservation of mechanical energy formula into something very quick and easy so now if we are to rewrite these two terms as their formulas we'll say a half times k the spring constant times the initial displacement squared will be equal to a half times the mass of the toy car times the final velocity squared there we go so having a look at this drawing or this diagram at the top here over here we're going to have 0.1 over here, we're going to have 0.2, which is what we are interested for this part of the problem. And up at the top here, we're going to have 0.3, which we're going to worry about in the in part B of this problem. So then, filling in our knowns and our unknown values. So we can see, okay, great, there's a half on both sides. So that will simply just cancel out with one another. Then we get left with k x i squared equals to mass times final velocity squared that'll be the velocity at part two of the diagram filling in our values we see that the gravity oh, the spring constant rather is 250 there is 0 0.04 meters of deflection and that will be equal to the mass of the car 0 0.1 kilograms times the final velocity there we go so now if we just tidy this up a bit we see Okay, great. Zero. Oh, let me just make that zero a little bit more attractive. So this will be equal to 0 0.4 equals 0 0.1 Vf squared. If we then divide both sides through by 0 0.1 to get Vf squared alone, we get that Vf squared is equal to 4. If we square root both sides, we get a final answer of Vf being equal to two meters per second and we obviously need a direction because velocity is a vector so we can just say cool that will be two meters per second to the right and there we have it part a of the problem done and dusted okay then moving on to part b again we can look at part one part two where we just calculated the velocity at part two and then part three up the top of there so part three is what we're going to be focusing on for this part of the problem so again we can write out our extended form of the conservation of mechanical energy equation initial kinetic energy initial spring energy and that will be equal to our final gravitational potential energy our final kinetic energy 
and our final potential spring energy. Wonderful. Okay, now we can cross out our zero term. So again, we know that the initial height or relative height will be zero. Initial kinetic energy, well, the toy car will start from rest as it's being pulled back in the spring. So that is zero. We know, okay, the spring has been retracted or compressed to begin with. So there will be some potential spring energy. And then we look at the final conditions over here. So will there be some final potential gravitational energy? The answer is yes, because there's a height difference. Will there be a final kinetic energy? And the answer is yes as well. So we want to try to find out what the kinetic energy of this toy car will be after it's gone up the slope. And then again, there will not be any potential spring energy because the car is no longer in contact with the spring. So if we turn these into or turn these terms into their equations, so half times k xi squared, and that will be equal to mass times the gravitational acceleration times the final height, and we're going to add that to the final kinetic energy. Apologies if you can hear my dog barking in the background, he's just wishing you guys good luck for physics. So, moving on then. Filling in our known and our unknown values, again we get that it will be a half times the spring constant of 250 times the initial displacement of 0.04 meters. And as we can see, the potential spring energy is the only source of energy we have going into the system to begin with. And this will basically be transferred into the potential gravitational energy and the final kinetic energy. There we go, height of, was it 0.18? Yes, it was. And we are looking for the final velocity after the toy car has gone up the slope. So here we go, oh, I see if we can replace that mass with a 0.1. There we go, okay, great, now we can fix this all up a little bit, make it look a little bit, a little bit better. So we have that 0 0.2 will be equal to 0 0.1764. And that will be plus 0 0.05 times the final velocity squared. Fixing this up a little bit, and we can find that the final velocity squared will be equal to 0 0.472, and square rooting both sides. Here we can find a final velocity of the toy car at the top of the slope. So that will be equal to 0 0.687 meters per second. Because it is a vector, we need a direction as well. So that direction will just be to the right and there we have it that is all we need to do for this problem they really are quite straightforward these questions will be easy marks for you in the exam the biggest challenge i'd say for these are just making your initial assumptions and deciding on what terms will be zero phenomenal that was everything on the conservation of mechanical energy and now we're going to move on to have a look at power which is essentially the rate at which work is done or that energy is expended or used up. So just to reiterate, here is the formal definition for power. It is word for word what I said on the previous slide as well, where power is basically the rate at which work is done or at which energy is expended. So this is a very easy definition for you guys to learn. And you, it's a good idea also to remember some of the definitions as there is the chance that you might be asked on some of these definitions for the theory aspects of your assessments. So what is the equation for power? Well, very simple. It is just work divided by time. So as you can see, the equation over here, P is equal to W over T, where P is power, W is work, T is time, all pretty self-explanatory. And the one new thing that we're going to be looking at here is the units for power, which are called the watt. And essentially, the watt is equal to one joule per second. So a joule is obviously a measure of work or energy, and second is a measure of time. So power is basically dependent on the rate at which work is done, as we said. So it's obviously work divided by time to give us power. So the faster the work is done, or the 
the shorter amount, the less time that it takes to complete a task that is requiring work, the higher the power will be. Obviously, the same is true the other way around. If there is a set amount of work done over a longer period of time, then the power will be somewhat lower. So then we also know that most appliances in our home require electricity, and obviously electricity is a form of energy. So often the costs that we accumulate over the months at, at our home are calculated in charge of power requirements. So a very common measure to measure the amount of energy that has been used is the kilowatt hour. So it's basically how many, for how many hours this amount of kilowatts were or was used. Then just a little interesting fact over here, the sun produces 1.3 kilowatts per meter squared when it shines on the Earth's surface. So obviously that is, that is a lot of power. If we were able to harness all of the power that the sun produced, we'd literally be able to take that power from a few seconds shining onto the Earth's surface, and that would be enough to power the whole Earth's energy requirements for the whole year. Obviously, that's an ideal world. There's no ways, there's absolutely no ways we could harness even, you know, like a significant fraction of the sun's power that reaches the Earth and reaches the Earth's surface. So, yeah, it's just good to know that if you were to have, say, a solar panel of two meters squared on your roof, then you know that the sun is producing, or you, you'll basically be receiving 2.6 kilowatts over those two meters squared. Uh, which is obviously a significant amount as well and just goes to show how efficient solar power actually is. And yeah, it's also important to note here the K in front of the watts, so kilowatts. So often power usages are extremely high. So kilowatts are a very common measurement for power just because often we use um, watts in the order of thousands. Okay, so I briefly touched on the cost of electricity delivery and power in a household. So a lot of electricity suppliers will charge for electricity in kilowatt hours, and they basically used a tiered or, or stepped costing system to encourage people to save. So if a household consumes less than 600 kilowatt hours per month, then the cost per kilowatt hour will be 240.04 cents per kilowatt hour. If the household then consumes more than 600 kilowatt hours per month, then the cost of one kilowatt hour will be 331.26 cents. So again, this costing setup, this tiered system is basically used to encourage households to use less electricity and to focus more on saving, which is obviously an important thing with all this load shedding going on at the moment. So here's an equation for energy in kilowatt hours where the energy will simply be equal to the power consumed times the amount of time that that power was active. You know, So for example, if you're running a kettle, which is rated at a th uh, one kilowatt, and it's running for two hours over the space of the month, then you will have two kilowatt hours due to the action of the kettle. Of course, within your house, you have a lot of appliances that require significant power. Mostly appliances that involve heating of some kind, you'll see mostly those are the ones that require the highest power. So things like your geezer, your oven, your electric stove, kettles, toasters, and so on. So here we have a more practical worked example where we are being asked how much power reaches the Earth while the sun is shining, given the radius of Earth is 6.371 times 10 to the 6 meters, or 6.3 million meters, and the sun produces 1.3 kilowatts per meter squared. And here we are told, okay, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So if we just draw out what is happening, here we've got the planet. Uh, let's draw the sun over here as well. So the sun's rays are going to basically be shining onto the Earth, but only onto half of the Earth. So the the rear side of the Earth is obviously going to be in shadow, you know, because we've obviously got day and night on Earth. Sorry, guys, I'm not an artist. I didn't do art in high school, but I'm trying my best. So there we go. There's the light side of the Earth and the dark side of Earth. So straight away, we know that the effective area of the Earth, just put a half there, will be equal to 4 pi r squared over 
2, and that will simply be equal to 2 pi r squared. Obviously, we want to put in the, let me just call this hemis or hemi rather, hemi for hemisphere, meaning half a sphere. So, obviously, we want to put in the radius of the Earth's radius. So, that'll be 2 pi times the radius of the Earth squared, 6.3. 7, 1 times 10 to the 6. There we go. And then we get that the area of the Earth facing the Sun at any given point will be equal to, let's pop this into the calculator, 40.03 times 10 to the 6 meters squared. So that's basically 40.03 million meters squared. So that's a pretty big surface area. Again, for this problem, we are going to be assuming that the Earth is spherical. Obviously, that isn't really the case. It is somewhat, um, I guess you could say, uh, squashed down on its, uh, on its axis, with the outer edges of the Earth being slightly wider than from pole to pole. So cool, now we know the area of a, the hemisphere, or half of the sphere of the Earth, and then we can say that the power absorbed by the Earth will be equal to the power of the Sun, which is 1.3 kilowatts per meter squared, times the area of the Earth, or the area of the hemisphere, rather. So then we can say that the power reaching the Earth will be equal to 1,300 watts per meter squared times the area, which was 40.03 times 10 to the 6 meters squared. There we go. If we pop this into our calculator, we find out that there is a whopping 52.04 gigawatts of power reaching the Earth. So gigawatts are basically in the order of 10 to the power of 9, so that's that's a lot of power, that's a, a really lot of power right there. Um, and like I said, uh, if the sun were, if we were able to harness all of that power, we'd be able to power the Earth for a very long time into the future. So over here we have another worked example where we see there is a woman running up a 3 meter high flight of stairs in 3.5 seconds. So the 60 kilogram woman started from rest, so initial velocity will be zero, and she had a final speed of two meters per second. So we can start off by writing down what we know. We know that the lady finishes with a velocity of two meters per second, there's a height of three meters, she has a mass of 60 kilograms, there we go, and this all takes place over 3.5 seconds of time. So we know that the work, the total work that this lady needs to do is the amount of work that will basically give her that kinetic energy. So we need to find out how much work needs to be done to get to that kinetic energy, as well as the amount of work required to overcome the gravitational force. So that will be the potential gravitational energy that we want to calculate. So Summing those two together will give us the total amount of work that this lady needs to do to start from rest and reach a speed of two meters per second while going up a flight of stairs three meters high. So filling in everything, or the equations rather, we know that kinetic energy is equal to half times mass times velocity squared, and that the gravitational potential energy is equal to mass times the gravitational acceleration constant times the height. We are to put the numbers in for everything that we know, we have all these values, so mass was 60, a final velocity of 2, again mass 60, gravitational acceleration constant of 9.8, and a height of 3. If we pop this into our calculator, we will get an answer of 1,884 joules, and so that will be required for this lady to get up the steps. Now we asked in this question to find the power that is required to perform this action. So again, we know that the equation for power is equal to work over time. We know how much work was required, 1,884 joules, and we know that it was 3.5 seconds of time. 
So we can then see that the power required by this lady to get up the stairs will be equal to 538.29 watts. There we go. And again, power is a scalar value, so there's no associated direction with it. So here we have another worked example on the cost of electricity. In this case, we are interested in what the cost is of running a 0.2 kilowatt computer for six hours a day, 30 days of the month, if the cost of electricity is 0.331 rand per kilowatt. So writing down all of our knowns, we know that the power is going to be 0.2 kilowatts. Obviously, we are working with kilowatt hours, so we can keep that in kilowatts for now. The total time, that's going to be a little calculation, so six hours times 30 days. We also know that there are going to be, oh no, we're working with hours, my bad, so we can just leave it as that. If we pop that into our calculator, we find that it takes total of 180 hours in the month. There we go. And again, we're working with kilowatt hours, so we can keep the time in hours as we did the power in kilowatts. And we see that the cost is equal to 0 0.331 rand, and that is per kilowatt hour. Wonderful. Okay, so now we can use our energy equation with power and time to find out just how much energy was used in kilowatts that month. So here we pop in our 0 0.2, multiply that by 180 hours, so we get our answer in kilowatt hours, and we find a okay, care. So this computer would have required a total of 36 kilowatt hours to run it for six hours a day, 30 days a month. We can then just find out the total cost, and that's going to be equal to the energy times the unit cost. I'll just abbreviate that, abbreviate that as UC. And we know the values for these. You know, it's going to be 36 kilowatt hours at a cost of 0 0.331 rand per kilowatt hour. We just fix up that zero there. Wonderful. And then we get a final answer of 11 rand. 92. So, I mean, really, that's not a very big expense. Again, like a computer will have a far lower power rating than something like an oven or a geezer or so on. So, as you can see, based on this, if you are wanting to save electricity, just shutting your computer off for more time is probably not the way to go about it. But then again, every little bit does add up. Okay, then on to the last section for today's lecture. We will be having a look at work energy and power in humans. Obviously, in humans, it will be similar to some of the animals you'll be working with, like horses and dogs, for example. So essentially, we can view our bodies as an energy conversion machine. And obviously, this will be applied to animals like horses and dogs. Any living thing essentially can be viewed as an energy conversion machine because there are so many different types of energy conversions taking place in our body without us even realizing it. For example, we have chemical energy, which is transferred into work or thermal energy or stored, in, stored as chemical energy in fatty tissue. So obviously the chemical energy that we are referring to here will be coming directly from the food that we eat and the work and thermal energy and so on will obviously, so work referring to activities to keep us alive and voluntary activities, things we actively want to do. Thermal energy obviously to regulate our body temperature and then the excess will be stored as chemical energy in fatty tissue. So then over here it says that if we eat more than what is needed, then the excess energy is stored in body fat. So essentially, every day we are going to require a certain amount of energy to one, stay alive and allow our body to perform these vital functions, and two, to basically allow us to engage in these voluntary movements, the thing we want, things we want to do. So that'll be like sitting at your desk working, you know, like ev everything, even if it doesn't require physical movement, is still requiring some sort of energy. So obviously, if we consume more energy than what we need, then that excess energy has to go somewhere. And as it says over here, that will then be stored in body fat. So here's just a slight extension of what was said on the previous slide, where we can see what actually happens to the food energy or the chemical energy 
that we obtain from food. So a majority of our, our chemical energy that we get from food will be transferred into thermal energy. So that's basically just to keep us warm so we don't die of hypothermia. I know it sounds a bit hectic, but that's the brutal truth. And some of this energy, food energy, will go towards work. So this is basically energy being expended by the body, work required in order to allow our body to perform its vital functions to keep us alive, and work to basically, as I said in the previous slide, allow us to engage in voluntary tasks, things that we are conscious of happening. At the bottom there, we see that some of the energy is also converted into stored fat, although that will mostly happen if we have an excess of food that we are consuming versus energy that we are cons uh, consuming or requiring each day. So having a look at the power consumed, particularly at rest, when you're not really doing very much. So a metabolic rate is basically the rate at which the body uses food energy to sustain life and to do different activities. Now there's also something called a basal metabolic rate or the metabolic rate while we are at rest. So as we can see over here, the basal metabolic rate, abbreviated as BMR, is the total energy conversion rate of a person at rest. It is divided among various systems in the body, and the BMR is basically a function of age, gender, total body weight, and the amount of muscle mass, which will obviously burn more calories than body fat. So because of this, athletes will naturally have a greater basal, basal metabolic rate due to this increased muscle mass. So the largest fraction of energy goes towards the liver and the spleen, and this is then followed by the brain. But of course, all vital organs will be taking a significant portion of this. So during exercise, the energy consumption of the skeletal muscles and the heart significantly increases. So this makes perfect sense, obviously, because when you're exercising your, bus your, <laughs> muscles, your muscles require a greater influx of energy to be able to perform these motions. The heart obviously needs to pump blood faster through the body so that the muscles can remain oxygenated and so that any any sort of, um, you know, creatinine or any waste products, there we go, from muscles can be removed, uh, lactic acid as well. And obviously the heart will need more energy to be able to pump the blood through the body at a faster rate. So as you can see here, this is just a table which is showing us the, the energy consumption of various vital organs in the human body. So over there on the left, we can see the amount of power consumed during rest. We've got the oxygen consumption in milliliters per minute and the percentage of the basal metabolic rate on the far right hand side. So obviously, I don't expect you to remember any of these off by heart, but it's just important or it's interesting to know how much power is basically going to different parts of the body when we're at rest. And then here's another table also just for your personal interest. So this is showing power consumed by various activities. So as you can see, it ranges from sleeping when our energy consumption is the lowest up to cycling as a professional racer where you are consuming a ridiculous 1,855 watts. So you can also have a look through this. We might refer to this table for some worked examples or in a test, you might need to refer to a table like this, but don't worry guys, you will have the table or the value included for the problem that you need to approach. So we get another type of work as well, and that is called useful work. Now essentially what useful work is, is work that is done on the outside world by a person. For example, this could be moving an object, lifting a weight, uh, moving a laptop or book around. All of this will require some sort of work being done on the outside world. So it's important to note that this useful work excludes any internal work done within the person's body. So this is referring mostly to the vital processes going on to keep you alive, to keep you breathing, to keep your heart pumping and so on. And obviously when you are doing work on the external work, technically the total amount of work you are doing is the work that's being done on the outside world as well as the internal work. So obviously through most of this course in physics we are not too concerned about the internal work unless specifically asked, but mostly you can assume we are only going to be dealing with useful work and problems. So work is done on the external world whenever a force is exerted onto one's surroundings. So again this makes perfect sense. If a force is exerted over a distance this will be work done 
and forces exerted by the body are non-conservative meaning they change the mechanical energy of the system worked upon, which is often the goal. For example, kicking a ball or lifting an object, moving a book or laptop. And why they're non-conservative? Well, we'll get to that more on the following slide. But basically, a lot of the processes aren't reversible. So again, we're going to get more into more detail on the next slide. And again, reiterating this, when an organism consumes more energy than they require or consume, then the body is forced to draw on chemical energy stored in fat. So basically, if you are exercising a lot every day and you're not eating that much, then essentially what's going to happen is your body will start drawing on the chemical energy stored in the fat. What the body will do first is it will start to lower the basal metabolic rate just to slow down the rate at which the energy is used in the body before it starts to draw on the chemical energy in the fat. Basically, your body views as the fat as uh, almost reserves, so like to be used in case of an emergency. So it's really a last resort for the body to start taking the fat away, which is often why it takes us a while to start seeing big results when we start exercising, for example. So all bodily functions require energy. This includes things that we're not even aware of going on within us. For example, this could be our heart beating, our, the movement of our digestive tract, breathing, which, you know, we don't, we don't have to think about breathing in order to breathe. Thinking as well, we, we aren't aware of the fact that we are thinking. I mean, this is getting a little bit esoterical and spiritual, but you're following my drift. Thermal energy is also a common byproduct of energy consumption in the body. And this is through the process of respiration. Now, respiration, we're going to be having a look at that in a lot more detail, I think, in the following lecture, where we're going to be looking at thermodynamics and heat within the body. And humans will shiver when they are cold. So this is just an example of how our bodies are able to increase the amount of work being done in the time. So basically, the power is going up. And the more power that is being consumed, the more energy will be expended, obviously. As a result, the body temperature will rise due to the thermal energy byproduct of the action. So again, this ties into the whole respiration process, which we will have a look at in more detail in the following lecture. And then here, 25% of all energy in a human's body is used to maintain an electrical potential across nerve cells to relay nervous impulses between the brain and the rest of the body. So that's pretty crazy. They're basically saying that 25% of all of the energy in a human's body is just used for our nervous system to basically relay those impulses from nerve to nerve effectively. All right, then finishing off the lecture today with two worked examples. So first of all, we see over here a cat. If a person who normally requires an average of 12,000 kilojoules of food energy per day consumes 13,000 kilojoules per day, he will steadily gain weight. How much bicycling per day is required to work off this extra 1,000 kilojoules? Assume that cycling requires 400 watts of power. So first of all, we see that the change in energy is going to be that 1,000 kilojoules. That is the excess energy that he's using each day. And we want to find out how much cycling does he need to take part in in order to burn off this excess energy. So we know that energy is equal to power times time. And we know that cycling will require 400 watts of power. We told that in the question. And our time is going to be the unknown for this question. We want to find out how long does this guy have to cycle for to burn off that excess power or that excess energy rather. So solving for time, we can make time the subject of the equation by dividing both sides through by t and we get that time will be equal to energy divided by power. So that will be the 1000 kilojoules that's 1,000 times 10 to the 3 because we're working in kilojoules there, which implies that it's a thought uh, to the power or the order of 1,000. And we know that the power is 400 watts. There we go. If we solve for time then, pop this into our calculator, we get an answer of 2,500 seconds of cycling in order to burn this off. Obviously, it's 
not really practical for us to imagine how long 2,500 seconds will be. So converting this into minutes, we find out, okay, it's 42 minutes of cycling. So that's, that's a significant amount of cycling to burn off that extra 1,000 calories, or kilojoules rather. Okay, then another worked example. This one might come as a bit of a shock to you, might put you off McDonald's for life, who knows. But anyway, a Big Mac contains 2,180 kilojoules of energy. How far would a person need to walk, assuming walking speed is 5 kilometers per hour, to burn off all the calories from the Big Mac? Walking at 5 kilometers an hour requires 280 watts of power. So I got this value over here, 280 watts of power from the table we saw, where it was basically explaining the power requirements for different activities that we take part in. So having a look, we can see, okay, the energy from a Big Mac is equal to 2,180 kilojoules. So again, that kilo means we multiplying through by 1,000. The velocity is 5 kilometers an hour. If we convert that to meters per second, so you simply divide through by 3.6, we get 1.389 meters per second. And there we go. We also know that the power for walking, or the power requirement for walking is 280 watts. Do we know anything else? No, we don't. Okay, cool. So again, we've got our equation over here where energy is equal to power times time. Solving for time, we get that it is equal to the energy divided by the power. Easy. Now we can put in the values for what we know. So that Big Mac will be 2180 times 10 to the power of 3 and that will be divided through by 280. So as you can see, it's, this first part of the problem is the exact same approach we used to the problem on the previous lecture slide. So here we see that the total time will be 7,785.71 seconds. So that's, that's a lot of time. I mean, if we convert this into minutes, we see that that's going to be 129.76 minutes. So, I mean, that's more than two hours of walking just to burn off that Big Mac. If we want to then calculate the distance, just to start off over here, we know that distance is equal to velocity times time. We know that the velocity is 5 meters per second, and we know that the time is 7,785.71, like that, and now we can get the distance it's a total of 10,814.35 meters. In other words, that is 10.8 kilometers that you would need to walk in order to burn off one Big Mac. So, yeah, again, sorry if this put any of you guys off eating Big Macs going forward, but at least now you know. All right, everyone, and that is it everything from me for today. I hope that you enjoyed today's lecture. Again, the second of two lectures on energy and work. And I hope that you've been enjoying the content as we go along. We are now almost two thirds of the way through the course. That was the seventh lecture that we just completed. So um, only another five to go, guys. Incredible job so far. Keep it up. I can see the work that you're all putting into it, the work and the effort. It doesn't go unnoticed. So Big ups to you all. Congratulations on making it this far. And go out and have a lovely day further. Go treat yourselves, do something nice this afternoon. And don't remember to also take it nice and easy and to look after yourselves every now and then. So yeah, guys, you'll be hearing from me soon. And all the best till then.